Okay, let's move on to OSPF and let's configure this up. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to, like I said, we're going to configure all of our routers using the rollover cable connected to the console port, and then we're going to test our network, and then we're going to look at some show commands. So let's dive into that network configuration. So I'm going to open up PuTTY, and I, have my, I do have my rollover cable connected to router 1 right now. So let's connect to router 1 and get configuring on that guy. Log in with the correct password, of course. All right, so to configure OSPF, what we need to do is we need to advertise the networks that are directly connected to our router. To do that, we are going to go into config mode, if I can spell it correctly, and we issue the command router OSPF, and then we have to give it this number, this process ID we can actually run multiple instances of OSPF on our router. Now you might be wondering what the heck does that mean? Well, think about it this way. When you're working on your PC or your Mac, you can launch Chrome, right, to browse the internet. So you can go to open up a Chrome window and then you can go to google.com and then you can open another window of Chrome and you can go to trainsignal.com and then you can open another window and you can go to globalmantics.com and you can open another window and go to veronicasplantnursery.com right so we can keep opening these chrome browser windows and each chrome browser window is a different instance of chrome and we're using it for a different purpose well i've already told you many times that a router is just like a pc ospf in fact the command router ospf turns on a little application so to speak little process inside the router and we can assign multiple OSPF sessions or processes on this router meaning we can run more than one OSPF session why would we do that well there's some sophisticated configurations where or not so sophisticated configurations where we want to do that however it far exceeds the scope of an entry-level CCNA course so when we're choosing our process ID here I recommend choosing a number and then sticking with it through your entire environment. And the reason for that is, is you don't want to have to go looking up which router OSPF process ID you've created on every one of a hundred different routers in your environment. Ideally, you'd want that OSPF process ID to be the same. Does it have to be the same? No. Should it be the same for practical reasons, for configuration reasons, for ease of administration? Yeah, absolutely. I like the number 10, so we'll pick 10, all right? Router OSPF 10 uh, is how we get it started. Again, you can pick any number you want here between 1 and 65,535. I recommend you be consistent when you do it. The second thing we need to do in OSPF, just like in any routing protocol, is we need to advertise the networks that are directly connected to our router. Okay, I can't say this enough. A lot of newbies in data networking don't want to advertise the networks that are directly connected to the router. They want to advertise something different. So here's my hint. Issue the command show, well, since we're at config mode, we have to issue the do command first. And then let's issue the show IP route command. And if we add the word connect at the end of it, it's only going to show us the routing table with our directly connected networks. So show IP route connect shows us our networks that are directly connected to this router. All right, now that we know which routes are active and directly connected to our router, we can then advertise them. To do that, I issue the command network. And then I specify the network prefix that I want to advertise. So we'll start with 172. Actually, let's start with the easy one here, 10.0.10.0. Okay, so network 10.0.10.0. Hit question mark, and it says, list the OSPF wildcard bits. Uh-oh, well, what the heck are wildcard bits? Well, we have two types of masks we use in data networking. One, we have spent an extensive amount of time on. So much so that if I bring it up, you may cry. And that is the subnet mask, right? We spent tons of time learning about the subnet mask and how to manipulate it. 
Well, a wildcard mask is directly related to a subnet mask. All right, so the wildcard bits mean wildcard mask. The wildcard mask was around long before the subnet mask. The reason is, is that when we built hardware back in the 70s and 80s, it was a lot easier to use this wildcard mask to do mathematical operations than a subnet mask. Well, what's the difference? Well, it's really just the inverse of the subnet mask. So my subnet mask for this network here, if I look at it, uh, my parent network says it is 10.0.0.0 slash 24, and my directly, oops, my directly connected network here is 10.0.10.0. Let's make this full screen so we can get more real estate. Okay, so parent network 10.0.0.0 slash 24, my child is 10.0.10.0 slash 24, which means my mask is 255. 255-2550. But my wildcard mask is the inverse of this. Okay, so wherever there's a 1 in the subnet mask, I'm going to put a 0 in my wildcard mask. And wherever there is a 0 in my subnet mask, I'm going to put a 1 in my wildcard mask. All right, so essentially what I'm doing here is I'm subtracting 255, 255, 255, 255, from my mask, and that will return a decimal equivalent of my wildcard mask. So 0, 0, 0, 2, 5, 5. And if we were to write that out in binary, it would be 24 zeros followed by 8 ones. All right, so my wildcard mask is nothing more than the inverse of my subnet mask. So if my subnet mask was 255, 255, 255, 0, my wildcard mask here is 0, 0, 0, 2, 5, 5. I then need to specify the area that this particular network is a part of. Well, we are only working with one area in OSPF. And I haven't really talked about areas yet, but areas are basically a way of scaling OSPF. So we can have one main area called our backbone area, and then we can have other stub areas connected to it. The main backbone area is always area zero. All of our OSPF networks must have an area zero. When you're configuring basic OSPF, you will put all of your networks in area zero. If you try to put them in a different area, it won't work. All right. There is a very precise process that we need to use in order to diagram and configure a multiple area OSPF environment. And the only way we can have an area number other than zero is if and only if we have more than one area in our OSPF network. All right, so the secret here is keep your area at zero unless you are implementing multi-area OSPF. So our area number has to be zero must be zero, can be nothing else but zero. Why do I say that so much? Well, uh, you know, I, I'm a classroom teacher as well, and I, I see a lot of students making the same errors over and over and over again, semester after semester after semester. So I, I really try to put the logic out there so you know that area zero is really your only option for an area number when you're first starting this. Okay, so we have our first network advertised, network 10.0.10.0. We have two more here. We have network 172.16.10.4 and 172.16.10.8. Both of them have a slash 30 mask. So let's configure these two next. Network 10, I'm sorry, 172.16.10.4. <laughs> Four. All right, and my wildcard mask is the inverse of my subnet mask. My subnet mask here is 255.255.252, which means my wildcard mask is going to be 0 .0 .0 .0 0.0.0.3. All right, I'm just really just subtracting from 255s there. Subtract each octet from 255, and that returns your wildcard mask. Okay. Put that in area 0 as well because we are configuring single area OSPF. And in single area OSPF, all networks must be in area zero. Last network, network 
8. 0, 0, 0, 3 is my wild card mask here, and I put it in area 0 again. All right, let's exit here and move on to router 2. So most of networking, as I like to see it, is oftentimes written on the back of a shampoo bottle. Once you understand the basics of it, the rest is just rinse, wash, repeat, right? So rinse, wash, repeat. So now I'm going to unplug my rollover cable that's currently plugged into router 1. I'm going to unplug it from there. I'm going to plug my rollover cable into router 2. Move into configuration mode, and we're going to issue router OSPF 10. Why did I pick 10? Again, it's arbitrary. I used it previously. I want to keep those numbers the same, only for convenience for me as an administrator. Next thing I need to do is I need to find out what my directly connected networks are. So I need to do a show IP route, and I'll add that connected at the end so that I only see the routes that are directly connected. Then on router 2, I can issue my network statements. So I have network 10.0.8.0 with a 24-bit mask, which means the wildcard mask is 000255, and that is in area 0. Right? Remember, all our networks are in area 0. 172, 16, 10.4. This time the mask is a 30-bit mask, which means our wildcard mask is 0 0.0.0.3. 172, 16, 10.0 with a mask of 0, 0, 0, 0003, and that is an area 0 as well. And if you noticed, we're going to see another one pop up here in a second. Oh, maybe not, maybe not. Uh, we got a log message, and our log message popped up while we're configuring here, and it says... OSPF-5 ADJ CHG, which means adjacency change, or, hey, I just formed a new neighbor relationship with neighbor 172.16.10.10, and it changed its state from loading to full. Now, there's different states of that neighbor relationship process, and we're going to learn about that in the advanced OSPF video. For the time being, know that we got a message saying that we got a neighbor relationship built. That's excellent. It means that we're in good shape. Okay, so we've got our three networks advertised here. Let's exit out of config mode and move on to router three. And go back to the shampoo bottle and rinse, wash, repeat. And now that I'm done with router 2, I'm going to unplug my rollover cable from the console port of router 2 and plug it into the console port of router 3. Log into the router here. We'll move into privilege mode. Move into configuration mode. Router OSPF. We'll use 10 again. We'll issue the do show IP route connect. Find out which networks are directly connected. Issue our network 172.16.10.0 with a mask of 0003 in area 0. Network 172.16.10.8 mask 0003 in area 0. We got another neighbor. Look at that. So we got another neighbor. They're popping up all over the place now. Last, we need to advertise network 10.0.9.0. Mask is 0, 0, 0, 000255, and that is also in area 0. Remember, all of our networks are in area 0 for the time being. Excellent. Well, now router 3 is configured. What we should see now is we should see a routing table that has all of our routes in our OSPF network. So if you issue the show IP route command, we should see a complete routing table with all of the networks that we have in our environment. Now, if you take a look at our diagram again, hopefully you've printed off the slides or you have access to it in, on a side window here, you'll see that we have, if we count them up, we have one, two, th we have six networks total. We have 10090, 10010, 10080, then we have 172.16.10.4, 10.8, and 10.0, six networks total. One, two, three, 
4, 5, and 6. But we notice this 1 here has something goofy going on here. We're going to talk about that in a second. But for the time being, all six networks are in our OSPF routing table. Now, why are there two paths, and why is it showing up goofy for 172.16.10.4? Well, if we look at the diagram again, we're on router 3 here, and we're talk the, the weird route is for 172.16.10.4. Well, if we look at how this is set up, first of all, OSPF uses a metric of bandwidth. All right, and by default, all of the bandwidths on all of our links, especially these serial links, are identical, which means that the cost to reach 172.16.10.4 from router 3 is the same to go through router 1 as it is to go through router 2, which means that we have two paths to get to this network. This is not ideal. However, in advanced OSPF, we're going to learn how to modify the bandwidth of these links to modify how our OSPF network behaves. For the time being, just know that we're going to load balance to any traffic that's going directly to network 172.16.10.4. So if I'm trying to ping either dot .6 or dot .5 from my workstation down here, the first packet will go this way, the second packet will go down through router 2. The third packet will go through router 1. The fourth packet will go through router 2, and so on. Let's go back to our configuration. So in our configuration now, we, can, we should be able to see that one of the paths is through 172.16.10.10, which is router 1. The other path is through 172.16.10.1, which is router 2. All right? Let's look at some other information. Let's look at the show IP OSPF neighbors. All right, if we do show IP OSPF neighbors, it's going to show us our neighbor ID, which is the router ID of our neighboring router. I haven't really told you how that router ID is calculated yet, but just know that that router ID or that neighbor ID in this case is a value that is either configured by the administrator or OSPF figures it out based on the IP addresses on the device. And we're going to learn about how that's picked in the advanced OSPF series. Okay, so we see our two neighbors here. So we have a neighbor of, this is router 1, and 172.16.10.6 is an IP address on router 2. All right, so these are our two neighbors for router 3. Last, if we look at our link state database. Now the link state database is pretty overwhelming, especially for a newbie. And what I'm going to look at is something called the router LSAs or the type 1 LSAs. This is going to show us all the LSAs that have been received by our router and recorded in the link state database. All right, so it's going to tell us the link state ID. This is the router ID right, the advertising router that's sending out the LSA. It has a sequence number there as well as some other information. Half the point of data networking is figuring out what not to look at. So let's ignore most of this, and I'll try to point out only the information that's relevant. So we received some LSAs from router 172.16.10.6, which is router 2. And we can see that router advertised to us network 172.16.10.0 with a mask of 255.255.255.252.255.255.255.252. We have a network advertised of 172.16.10.4 with the same mask, slash 30. And then last, we have from router 2, we have network 10.0.8.0 with a mask of 255.255.255.0. All right, if I continue on here, we're going to find the next advertising router, 172.16.10.9. That happens to be router 3. All right, and here are all of the networks that router 3 is advertising. And then we have advertising router 172.16.10.10. 
and the networks that it's advertising, 172.16.10.8, 172.16.10.4, and 10.0.10.0. .10 all right, so our link state database is showing us all the LSAs that all the routers have sent to us, as well as the LSAs that we have sent out as well. This link state database is then used to determine the best path to every single network that it learned about through this process. Last, let's go back now and try to ping all of the interfaces on our routers. All right, we looked at the routing table, we looked at the neighbor table, we looked at the link state database. Let's see if it actually works. So I'm gonna open up a command prompt here, and let's try to ping all of the interfaces in our network. So I'll start first, whenever I ping, this is a secret with ping, ping is one of my favorite utilities to use, except I see it misused very, very often. So ping, what you wanna do, is when you're testing is you want to ping devices that are nearest to you first so ping IP addresses that are closest to your device first and then slowly work your way away from that and what that'll do is it'll tell you if you do have a problem where the problem might exist alright so let's just start with that we'll ping my default gateway 10.0.10.1 and I get a reply from that excellent then let's ping the two serial interfaces on router 1. So ping 172.16.10.5, which is serial 0 of router 1. And I get a reply. That's excellent. And then we'll ping the other side, which is 10.10, 172.16.10.10. And I get a reply from that. Awesome. Let's go down and see if we can ping all three IP addresses on router 2 now. So we'll ping 172.16.10.6, which is the IP address nearest to router 1 and my workstation. And excellent, I get a reply from my serial 1 interface of router 2. Let's ping the fast Ethernet interface of router 2. Ping 10.0.8.1. Excellent, get a response from that as well. We'll ping serial 00 of router 2, 172. 16.10.1. Outstanding. It's looking very good so far. Let's go to router 3. We'll ping 172.16.10.8. We get a reply for, ooh. Well, that's not right, is it? We sent a ping to 172.16.10.8, and we got a reply from 10.0.10.1. What happened? Why is this happening? So I want you to ponder that for a moment and think about what I just did as a network administrator. What kind of address did I just ping? Is that address a network address, a host address, or a broadcast address? Well, simply looking at the drawing, we'll see that 172.16.10.8 is a network address and apparently, when in Windows I ping a network address to the router, the router is going to respond, the router containing that address, because actually router 1 does have network 172.16.10.8, and it's replying saying, yeah, I have that, but it's replying with the default gateway's IP address. So we get some goofy results here because I pinged the wrong address. Pinged. Should it be pung or pinged? I don't know, some English... Some English student is going to have to help me with that one. Okay, so let's ping the correct address. Let's do ping 172.16.10.9, and that will get us a reply from router 3. Let's do the other two interfaces on router 3, ping 10.0.9.1. We get a response. And last, ping 172.16.10.2, and that is the last interface on router 3. So we have successfully set up a dynamic routing protocol to transfer our routes for us so that we don't have to create all the static routes in our environment to build our routing tables. I look forward to seeing you in the advanced OSPF video. For the time being, thanks for watching this one, and I look forward to seeing you in all of our train signal videos. Have a good one.